Governments cannot stop printing currency. They literally cannot. There is no way. If they do, there's immediate bankruptcy and then God knows. I, I've tried to like map out in my head what happens and they were just like, okay, from today onwards, we're going to be fiscally responsible. We're not going to print any more money and we're not going to be able to, you know, finance deficits through debt issuance and monetizing debt through central bank money printing. Like, we're just not going to do that anymore. I can't conceptualize what would happen to the world. There would be such a mind-bending, like, our reality would smash to bits. But the, the thing is with, like, printing, I think you are kicking the can down the road, but whilst it's happening, like, it's so slow and insidious that you don't quite... It doesn't smack you in the face. Whereas if they do decide, we can't pay back this debt, we're not going to keep printing money, we're going to be fiscally responsible, you just shatter the unit of measurement of value that the entire world uses. All right, Daniel Semperi Pico, welcome to Bitcoin for Millennials. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, man, I'm I'm looking forward to this uh, conversation. I uh, I love your tweets. I think it's also uh, I think your journey is interesting. You haven't been in Bitcoin for super long, I would say, but I think you really get it. And for the people listening, I would suggest following uh, Daniel on Twitter because he has really interesting insights into his thoughts about Bitcoin. So yeah, man, I'm excited to to talk today and, and meet. You've you've been an entrepreneur for some time. You discovered Bitcoin in 2019, then you got fully into it in 2020. Can you share a bit about this journey and, and what made you go all in on Bitcoin? Yeah, so I mean, the the Bitcoin journey, I think I first, yeah, I first heard about it in 2017 from, I used to be a real estate broker and then I had a, I had a real estate business in Hong Kong and I was out viewing with, I was out viewing apartments with a client in Hong Kong one day and, uh, you know, over the course of like an afternoon, you might view 10, 12 apartments, you spend three or four hours together. So you're just chatting about stuff. And this guy is like, you know, he's like an ex, he was, he was American. He was like an ex American college football player, quite good looking. I could tell he's successful by like the, but his, his housing budget was very good. So I knew he's like, this guy is professionally successful. Uh, and then he's just started talking. He started telling me about Bitcoin and Ethereum. Right? He was telling me about both at the time. And so I remember, okay, it was like, it was like the, the messenger mattered for me to receive the message, right? Because the person, you know, it, the person that I was hearing it from was somebody that I was like, Okay, I trust this guy or this guy's successful. There was, there was like some personal brand aspect of him that made me open to the idea. But of course, you know, I was like, okay, this guy's told me about Bitcoin. I should look into it. I go home. I put Bitcoin in on Google, probably read like the first thing that comes up, which is some BBC article saying, you know, that it's tulip mania and it's a bubble and it has no intrinsic value. And then I read that it's like open source code. So anyone can copy and paste it and make their own Bitcoin. <laughs> and I, I'm like, okay, this is, this seems like a scam or just, you know, I'm like, I'm not into it. But of course, you know, I make a note to watch the price. And you, I think at the time, this was like March or April 2017. So maybe the price was like one or $2,000, right? And the price went all the way up to 20K, as we know. And then it crashed down to 3,000 at the beginning of 2018. And I was like, see, I knew what I was talking about. I'm a goddamn genius. This was a scam. <laughs> it was a bubble, right? And then, of course, I kept an, I, you know, it would still pop up in the news from time to time, but, you know, I, I didn't really pay attention to it anymore. I, I bought a business and, well, I was in the process of buying a business in 2019 when I was on summer holiday in Portugal in 2019. And I saw that Bitcoin had gone back up to 10K. And I was like, okay, you know, bubbles don't reinflate back up to like halfway what the insane bubble price was before, right? So there must be something here that I'm missing if there's so many other people that are willing to put their money back into Bitcoin after what happened. So I bought some and I bought some and it was on Binance. So I signed up to Binance. I bought some on Binance and I left it there for like an entire year and a half or something didn't pay attention to Bitcoin at all. The, the, the purpose of buying it was, I thought I'd get some skin in the game and that will force me to look into it more deeply. And it wasn't until I was, I had to spend 14 days in, in hotel quarantine, re-entering Hong Kong at the end of 2020. And I just went down, you know, I, I watched a couple of Michael Saylor podcasts and that just sent me down the rabbit hole. And, you know, by the end of that quarantine, I was selling everything I owned and buying Bitcoin. I love that. I, yeah. I love that the common theme is I heard it, I got into it, or I didn't get into it, 
then I saw the price crash. So I thought I was a genius. And then when it went back up, I actually started paying attention. This is a very recurring path, I would say, that that I've heard. Was that then also your moment, the fact that it really didn't die? Or was there anything during you know, your study where you were like, okay, now I really have to sell everything that I have? Uh, so, in, so in 2020, so I bought this business in 2019 and I, we spent, it, it was a sort of a turnaround. So, so I spent like however long it was turning it around. And then once the business started doing well, it, you know, I had to, I had to find a place for the excess cash flows of the business. And this is like, I hadn't looked at, I hadn't looked at investing in stocks or any sort of investing. When I was, when I was a teenager, I was obsessed with Warren Buffett and like value investing. And like, I wanted to become an investment manager. Right. So back then I would invest in stocks and stuff. But then once I got a job and, you know, started making a little bit of money and just being young and, and just, you know, spending all the, not, not thinking about the future, you know, I'd make money, I'd spend money. So this in 2020 was the first time I'm like, okay, I have excess money and I need to, I'm about to get married. I need to start thinking about investing it somewhere. So I was investing, I was buying stocks, you know, all this is like, whilst stocks are shooting through the roof during COVID, like, I think I bought some Spotify right before they announced the Joe Rogan deal. I bought like Tesla before it went parabolic. Genius, and, of course. Right. Yeah, of course. Right. <laughs> and yeah, it was just pure luck, pure timing luck. So yeah. So when I listened to just in looking at companies and investing and, and just reading a bit more about that, when I listened to a Michael Saylor podcast, and I remember him explaining that Bitcoin was like a monetary network, just like Facebook was a social network or Apple's a mobile network. And that there's some network, some, it was like some mix of an asset with a built in network. And you could, by owning a bit of some, by owning Bitcoin, you could essentially own a piece of the network. That was like mind blowing to me. I really remember that, that sticking. And then I was like, yeah, and this is, I, it just seemed like with Bitcoin, I, you know, with stocks, I had to understand what Tesla's business is and what Square's business is and what Spotify's business is. And like, I think is the CEO going to mess something up or whatever with Bitcoin? There's not, none of that to worry about. Once you understand the fundamentals of Bitcoin, then that's it. You don't have to like, you don't have to like keep track of it so much, right? You yeah. can go on and do other things with your life, which yeah, became being obsessed with Bitcoin. But what I mean is like, it's a place where you can just park your money long term and you don't have to worry about if the ceo is going to die or if they're going to change strategy or if another competitor is going to come along and you know steal market share from them all the operational risky stuff and the human risky stuff just didn't exist for bitcoin so i was like this is brilliant because i have my business i want to focus on that and i don't want to be a, a stock picking investor you know as a side hustle i yeah. just want to make money and have somewhere safe to put it and so yeah so i, I was like this is, this is the asset I want to earn most of my, I want most of my savings to be in this. Yeah. To be honest, I think this is the pitch for not, not only millennials, but I think especially for, for millennials, right? Like if you're in the phase of your career where you're starting to make more money or with your business, etc. It's actually funny that you pitch this because I just, uh, this morning I ran into something, someone that had, I hadn't seen in like two years and I was walking on the street. They saw me, we had a chat and he was like, Oh, I see you're, you know, talking about Bitcoin a lot. I'm like looking into investing, etc. But uh, isn't Bitcoin like really speculative? And I said, what you said, plus I said, you know, you're also speculating on the fact that Elon Musk wakes up in the morning, right? Or that Tim Cook doesn't die. And, you know, so everything is speculative, right? Like this argument is not really an argument, but what I use as an argument for Bitcoin is the same as what you said. Like it's a constant, right? Like I can research how it works. Once I understand that the entire goal is to keep showing that it just follows the rules as intended, like it stays the same, basically Bitcoin as a, as an asset compared to, you know, I don't know, supply issues from Tesla or uh, some legal stuff from app or, you know, what, whatever information is out there that could influence the thinking of people about this stock or the actual performance of the company. And yeah, I don't really have time for that. Like, and, and also I'm not really good at it, you know, like there's trading houses and, you know, in, in investment managers that have like satellites in the air to have like quicker information or trade quicker. Right. And, you know, I don't want to be at home after my job or my venture and then just spend time on figuring out 
is this still a good thing to own or what happened with Tesla today, right? Like it's, it just takes up time and most people are not investors, but people don't realize that they kind of like get sucked into this risk taking path basically without actually understanding why. Yeah. I was just thinking like, if you like, you know, if you're into reading financial reports and annual reports, and then in <laughs> spending your spare time trying to invest your money to beat the market. But even then, like, you should only, you should consider that entertain. You should consider that the same as like you'd go to a casino or a football game or to the cinema. You allocate a little budget to play around with because just statistically, you're going to lose against the S and P 500, right? Mm -hmm. You're not going, you, what is it? 99% of like investment, active investments do worse than the S and P 500. So even if you did like it and you're like, no, I don't mind spending all my time reading all this stuff, you're still better off not doing that. If you want maximum returns, if you want it as entertainment, fine, you know, set aside whatever it is, 10K, 20K, play around, try and beat the market. But the majority of our money should still be in, well, my opinion, Bitcoin is the new S&P 500 index fund. I think that in like 15 years, so I'll give a bit of context to what I'm about to say. At this same time, when I was getting into Bitcoin, all my friends were also starting to think about like investing for the future. And, and they all read this book called The Simple Path to Wealth. And I think the premise of The Simple Path to Wealth is buy S&P 500 index funds. Yeah. Right. And it shows Compound you how interest. The, yeah. literally it's that. And it's like yeah. how you can't beat the market. You should just buy this, hold it for 30 years and you will be fine when you get to retirement age or whatever. Right. I think that somebody will write the simple path to wealth equivalent but instead of S&P 500 index funds, it's going to be Bitcoin. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, Bitco, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet. I've been using mine for about a year now, and I love the design and ease of use. And with Foundation's mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. The Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app, or any of your other favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a microSD card and is built with 100% open source hardware and software. I love what Zach and the team at Foundation are building. And to learn more about their mission, please check out episode 27 of this podcast. If you consider buying a Foundation Passport, you can use code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, to get $10 off at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. But that's going to be a really thin book, right? Because I think the, the S and P 500 path to, you know, retirement, right? So the idea is like you, you invest uh, every month or, you know, DCA every month into this index fund, you keep it for 30 years and then you have like $3 million, right? Or whatever, like there's this uh, calculator, you know, maybe that book should open with what are dollars? <laughs> what is money? Right. Because I think that's like the next question to that strategy. Like that strategy, of course, you know, could work if you are accumulating units of dollars. But I think the, the conversation that Bitcoin joins and shakes up is what is the value of, of these dollars? So you think you saved because you, have more units, right? Or you profit because you have more units. But yeah, once you understand that the value of those units in 30 years will, you know, most likely be way, way down, then you still have a problem. Like then, then it's not a good strategy. And I think that's where Bitcoin kind of like enters this conversation. Yeah. I think if you look at the 30, if you look at the S and P 500 over 30 years, it's probably you know, you have the same purchasing power. It, it just helps you just keep your purchasing power, right? You're not necessarily increasing it, which yeah, is much better than 
much better than saving in dollars. 100%. But with, but, yeah. With, yeah, with Bitcoin, we're hoping that we can do a lot better than that. Exactly. And it, it's also this, well, yeah, so you have these units, but again, as you said, like they don't purchase more, but I think, and I had this example on a lot. I think you'll like it. If you go to like tradingview.com and you look up, you know, any stock or index and put it in Bitcoin, it's at all time low. If you put it in dollar, it's almost like all time high. Right. And yeah. then you have the Nasdaq, Nasdaq, like tech stock index, which is nominally uh, in dollar terms, I would say at all time high, or maybe a bit above. But if you denominate it in the M2 money supply, right? So the, the amount of currency units that are, that are out there, which is a better indicator for the actual value of each unit, you see that the NASDAQ, so that again, the tech stocks index is lower than at the peak of the dot com bubble, which, you know, objectively is just wrong. Like we have way better tech 24 years after the dot com bubble, but in value, they are lower and that's only because what we used to denominate in just lost value and for me that was one of the eye openers as well like okay it, you could have this strategy of putting x amount in a tracker for 30 years then you have x amount of units but it's so unsure what the value of of that is right and then if you go to this corner or, or the subject of you know the u.s debt spiral and all these things like the fact that that's accelerating then in 30 years it's so unsure where it's going to be at that i'd say like you have to look for what is an alternative to that kind of like passive strategy right like as you said like you, you just want to save in something and don't look at it every day yeah you know what's so funny is that i never so when i when I thought I understood Bitcoin well enough to go all in, I don't remember it necessarily being about how, you know, governments can print an infinite amount of fiat. That didn't come into play like, in terms of, of me assessing Bitcoin's potential value until later. Mm. The first thing was just that it was like a, you know, it was a network for money. It was a monetary network. Yeah. And so I, I kind of looked at it as like a, a weird tech play. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> but and then on top of that, you have the fact that governments are governments cannot stop printing currency. They literally mm -hmm. cannot. There is no way. The only way, well, if they do, there is immediate bankruptcy, and then God knows. I, I, I've tried to like map out in my head what happens if they just did. They were just like, okay, from today onwards, we're going to be fiscally responsible, and we're not going to print any more money, and we're not going to be able to, you know, finance deficits through debt issuance and monetizing debt through central bank money printing. Like we're just not going to do that anymore. I can't conceptualize what would happen to the world. There would be such a mind bending, like our reality would smash to bits, mm. right? It because, would also be chaos, right? Like e either yeah. option is bad. It would break. It, it's, but the, the thing is with like printing, I think y you are kicking the can down the road, but whilst it's happening, like it's so slow and insidious that you don't quite, it doesn't smack you in the face. Right. Whereas if they just, if they do decide we can't pay, pay back this debt, we're not going to keep printing money. We're going to be fiscally, fiscally responsible. You just shatter the, the, the unit of measurement of value that the entire world uses. Right. Yes. The U S I'm talking about, well, in the case of the U S dollar, right? Everything, everyone measures their currency against U S dollars and U S dollars measure their value against God knows what. Nothing. Yeah. Well, this uh, is why I love Bitcoin so much. Like you have all these little touch points that you could dive uh, deeper on, right? Like if you look at the US debt clock, for example, and you see unfunded liabilities, which is like, I don't know, 40 trillion or something, right? Like that's uh, pensions and Medicare and all these things in, 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 in America. And you think like, okay, they're never going to be able to repay that. So even if they would be fiscally responsible, there's still this giant hole of promises that will never ever be paid, right? Like, so that could be one thing that you, that you look into. But the other thing, as you said, you know, the dollar is the world reserve currency. So why do we talk about the dollar so much? So much because it's the best. <laughs> we have to keep in mind that all the other currencies are worse yeah. than the US dollar and the US dollar is doing very, very, very badly. Right. And so I think that's even another part of the rabbit hole that should show you some sort of signal that you know whatever your job is uh, or your interest like this should be of anyone's interest basically yeah the shame is that people don't understand what money is mm. 
And so without that, it's very hard, unless you grasp Bitcoin from the like, oh, the technology aspect of it and think that it's a promising technology because you might be able to like put, you know, you buy into maybe a bit of blockchain stuff and crypto, you know, yeah. that we're going to put car deeds and real estate deeds on the blockchain. And it's like, it, it, it's the, the whole crypto thing is hilarious because it's people just rebranding a database Right. The majority of it is th those concepts for the past seven years and there's nothing. It's literally just rebranding. It's <laughs> yeah. like people think they've discovered the database for the first time and except like now it's called the blockchain and it's decentralized, even though it's not, you know, most mm. other cryptocurrencies are not actually decentralized. Yeah. So it's just the, 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 the crypto technologist side of things is I just don't understand how they don't get that it's just a database that they're just talking about a database and that's already existed. It's like tokenize. To me, when I hear tokenize, it just means like you're going to make something digital and put it on a database. Yeah, it's like double Which, digital or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's like an, an extra step. I, I think the main difference here is permission versus permissionless. I had a tweet last week, like there's only one use case for a permissionless decentralized blockchain and that is money because all the other blockchains are permissioned right like if it's from like some sort of bank or other corporate where they say like i mean i was involved when i worked at a bank with a project that tracked like the grain from like a supplier and then transport to the buyer or whatever and i always felt like well you know it's a nice proof of concept that's fine but you can do this with a scanner and excel sheet right like okay the freight is now here now it's there or something yeah like, it's not you know, and it's not permissionless. I think that's a, a good term for people to understand. Permissionless is totally wild and free. The, the only thing that exists like that is Bitcoin, right? It's just an open protocol. Anyone can join it. Anyone can copy it. All, all these things. And any other blockchain is, or, or blockchain type project or initiative, whatever. It's just not like that. It's all permissioned, whether it's built by a startup or a foundation or a corporate company. And nothing is permissionless. I mean, even if like, let, let's say that we're being, let's give, you know, the people who believe that these things are decentralized the benefit of the doubt and say, okay, you know, I've, what's the avalanche, for example, avalanche is, let's say that it is decentralized, truly decentralized like Bitcoin. And what's the use of it? Like yeah, we don't, don't know. you know, but you can it, build a system where Ava token fuels interactions, but, but all of it, that's for all, every of these blockchain. Yeah. Th it, it's like, it's like they're all platforms for creating your own casino chip or, you know, get thing that people can gamble on the value going up. That's basically it. I think honestly the the you know I heard I heard crypto being called a shitcoin casino for a long time. But then like one day semi recently, like the last year and a half, like I truly understood it that it is a shitcoin casino because it is literally just gambling. It is mm -hmm. people just gambling like they would at a casino. And there's a house like there is in the casino. There's a house in crypto. It's like the founders and the VCs who launch these projects, right? Yeah. They're yeah. the ones that create this token out of thin air that does nothing other than maybe you think it's going to go up in value. So you buy it. Yeah. I think, the, it. yeah. I think the bigger point to steer people towards, you know, one, now that we're talking about this is, you know, Realize why are people doing this? You know, I think we touched upon, you know, playing the stock market and, you know, the entire reason why you're doing that, probably subconsciously, right, is because you just cannot save in your money anymore. People think they need to be investors. People think they need to play the stock market. And then crypto is then maybe for younger people, right? And, you know, it's a, it's a game, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's a zero sum game because you're playing other people. And again, if you enjoy it, you know, totally fine. But I think you have to be honest about the game that, that, that you are playing. But do you think that this is like the biggest hurdle people need to get over before like researching and adopting Bitcoin? Or do you think that is, you know, questioning what is money as you alluded to or, or is it something else? Yeah. Just, I don't think that P, I don't think that the majority of people. I think the only way Bitcoin wins is if it's it, it's the best money and we have to use it. We basically people are compelled or forced to use it just like they are forced to use an iPhone or to use a laptop to work because it's the best technology to achieve some form of some outcome, right? So if Bitcoin can be the best thing at achieving the outcome of what we want for money, which is, you know, store value, medium of exchange, unit of account, then 
that's how most people will use it. Otherwise, it's going to be, you know, the people, the few people that take the time to study it, to understand it. It's just like how most people don't even have like $500 saved in the bank. They don't understand how an economy works and they don't understand how to negotiate a better salary or they don't understand that they should upskill themselves so they can make more money so that they can have a better life, right? They'd yeah. rather just sit in front of a TV and watch Netflix and, you know, eat Cheetos and they know what type of underwear Kim Kardashian wears and they know who Prince Harry is married to or isn't married to or they know like all this useless information that's just like rubbish filling their brains. And that's what most people are kind of like, right? So. Yeah. They're, they don't, they don't use dollars because they know the dollar is the best fiat currency or whatever. They just use that because that's what people use to go and like, they give a dollar to someone at the convenience store and they get a can of Coke yeah, back. Yeah. Right. So I think that's how everyone ends up using Bitcoin. It isn't because they're going to go down the rabbit hole and understand all the stuff that we understand about it. They don't even understand any of the stuff about the money they use right now. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's more just my hope or something. I don't know. Like I, I, I agree with you there. And, and I think I was there too. Maybe you there, uh, you as well. Like if you grow up in a, in a Western type country, especially, yeah, you just get money. You go to a store, you exchange it for a thing and you're like, okay, well, apparently, you know, this is how it works. And you're not really incentivized to ask the question, you know, what is money or go down that rabbit hole. But I'd say, you know, sometimes you see these, TikToks or reels like going viral of people who are questioning or I love to go, for example, on Reddit. I go to the millennials Reddit or my country's Reddit and you see people are struggling. You know, they are following the path they think they should follow. Like I went to school, I got a job, but now I can get a house. Like what's going on? Right. Or, you know, in, in our age with millennials, like, oh, should I have kids or not? Or like all, all these things that were normal for your parents and your grandparents are not normal for you. And I, I do think more people are at least being aware of the fact that that problem is there. Understanding where it comes from, I think is the second part of that conversation or realization. Yeah. Um, but you do see, at least from my perspective, way more people realizing, okay, something, something is going on. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the internet has made education and information, you know, basically free and accessible to anyone that cares to know it right and so in that sense we are definitely i would say we're more educated as a society that there will be more people who can find stuff out because they can google it, they can ask gpt or they can look on the internet imagine back in the day where you had to like if you wanted to know something first of all there had to have been someone who bothered to put in the effort to like write it down and mm -hmm. then you had to trudge over to the library and use some like analog search system to even it. figure out which book mentioned the thing that you wanted to find out like it's a crazy the, the accessibility that we have to find information now. We can literally yeah. talk to a computer and it just tells us, inf like not even Google anymore. It was a, I remember it was amazing when Google started work, like you could type in a question and it would kind of like be really good at figuring out what website to serve you to give you the answer. Because I remember a time where Google, it was hard to search stuff. Like you really mm -hmm. had to almost become like, you had to know exactly how to type the question in kind of like prompting it AI now, right? Yeah. But yeah, now we can just type it into ChatGPT and we can get it. So there's definitely, I would, yeah, I would agree that there's more people that know what's going on, but that's only one part of the equation, right? There is, yeah. there is the access to information and then there has to be the willingness from people to want to go and find it out. And in Western countries, I think people look to Bitcoin because they're looking to essentially increase their wealth, right? I came to, I, I was buying Bitcoin because I thought it was a good place to put my money and I thought it would make me more money, right? Yeah. And then in places where fiat currency, you know, where it's not a given that it works and that it holds its value as much as in the in a lot of the Western world, I think in those places, people are also more aware that like this money thing, it can go away tomorrow. It can be, you know, it can be worthless tomorrow. It can be confiscated by the government tomorrow. And so I need to find a different way to store my wealth. And maybe I go to the store tomorrow with this like, Venezuelan Bolivar and I can't buy the bread that I could buy yesterday because of hyperinflation. And so those people are also, they have an incentive to look at Bitcoin and there's a need for something like Bitcoin because the money they have is broken, right? And then if you're looking to get wealthy, you have a problem, which is you're not wealthy, you want to get wealthier. So you look at what are the possible solutions to this and Bitcoin comes up as an investment thing. But for the people that maybe don't have ambition or they don't believe they can get 
richer. They, you know, there are people that just either through low self worth or their circumstances, they just don't think that they can improve their life in any way. And you know, their dollars work for going to the store and buying some shit. There, there is no problem for them to fix there. Yeah. Well, it's kind of this. It's it's uh, I I see Bitcoin not as an IQ test. It's more like an ego test. I think uh, your example of how you shared that you talked to a client and thought he was you know respectable and it triggered you to look at Bitcoin. But then you know the TV told you that you know it's it's a scam and you went and you went with that. How do you look back on on that now? Do you also see it as kind of like this this ego test that you know gradually? I would say like permeates over time, right? Like at one point you were like, okay, now I'm curious enough to actually, you know, take the steps to to learn what this actually is. Yeah, I mean, I think it was, so the whole thing about thinking it's a scam and stuff, I think, you know, I look at some of the people in my life who I was a lot, I was a lot more like them before than I am now. I think Bitcoin has changed me in a lot of ways. But one of the ways is that you think you know, the, the yuppie, the yuppie elite, right? The yuppie elite think that because they read the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times and the BBC and Bloomberg, that they're smart and well informed, right? And that's obviously, I'm not going to say that just because you read those things, you're dumb, but uh, you realize how much propaganda, how much just factually incorrect information, how much of a lack of understanding about certain topics that journalists write about, how they're, journalists have biases that they inject into their journalism. And so when you shatter the illusion that like mainstream media, these reputable, they're reputable sources of information and truth, when that shatters, then you question everything, especially if you are using them as your barometer for what's true and what's not. And, you know, and that to stay, to stay educated and informed. Yeah. And that's not but even going into the fact that like, that's not even going into the fact that most of the news is irrelevant to your day-to-day -day life and does not impact you. And all it does is make you, you know, if, if some tragic thing happens in a nation, you know, 5,000 miles away from you, someone goes into a school and like stabs a bunch of kids, that's messed up, like so messed up. But it doesn't make your life any better to know that information. It's horrendous. It's good to be empathetic and be like, I feel very sorry for those parents, but there's nothing you can do. So you may as yeah. well not know that. And if you yeah. go on most news websites, like that's what it is. It's like murder, rape. Someone's complaining about like NHS being underfunded. Everything's going, you, you can get very doom and gloomy from mm -hmm. reading the news. But yeah, but that's not even what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about when they try to report on certain things that it's like factually incorrect. There's bias, yeah. blah, 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 blah. So for me, it was, the bit like Bitcoin shattered that for me. And I think a lot of people still like live in that world where the media is the truth bearer. Do you know this article? I have it in front of me. Why the yuppie elite dismiss Bitcoin? Yeah, great. I, I, it's one uh, of the first ones I read and when I got into Bitcoin nice. by uh, Jesse, right? Yeah, it's from Jesse Meyer. So for people listening, Google why the yuppie elite dismisses or dismiss Bitcoin. It's on their website called called Citadel 21, but he has like this matrix, right? With like low high IQ and low high trust in the system. And the yuppies are like on the top, right? They are like smart, but they also trust the system, right? So yeah. they think they are in the know, but we, you know, or well, we like Bitcoiners are also smart. You know, a lot of people are high, high IQ, but they have less trust in the system. But so they are polar opposites, mm. basically. And that's, you know, why, why your yuppie friends probably then like dismiss you or you, you know, you just follow the herd or the group that you're in, of course. But what I think is funny is that once you really understand Bitcoin and you see what like legacy media writes about it, you know, it's nonsense. So then you start questioning, okay, but what else is nonsense, right? And I love, by the way, the example that you give, I, I've said this for many years, like sometimes there's this news item in my country, you know, small Western European country about like, okay, there's a bus in India that drove off the road and like 50 people are dead. Right. And then it, it, it says like, oh, uh, it could be due to the road conditions in India or something, something. And then I've always thought about like, why is this news? What is the, what is the goal of this message? Right. So let's say this happens in my little country. Do you think that would be on the news in India? Guaranteed not. Like why? Why, why would that be? Right. So 
what is, what is then the goal of a message like this? It's either to, I don't know, bring your vibe down like, oh, that's so sad or just, you know, put random information in your head. But sometimes I also think like, you know, just the tone of, of the text is also kind of like, well, in India, the roads are shit, but here they're, they're great or something like <laughs> that. But I, I've never been able to put my, my finger on it, but. Yeah, so I had to think of that when, when you said it, like it has not, what, what is the purpose of something like that? Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't speak to like whether they, they will like target news like that from certain countries to make their own country seem better or not. But what I will I say don't know is either, that, but, yeah, yeah, what I, what I will say is that the news is filled with news like that, regardless of where it's from, of like mm -hmm. people dying and all that, because if you understand the business model of news, it's, it's an advertising model, right? They're trying to get attention. They want yeah. you to click on an article, read it so they can serve you an advert. And uh, if you study copywriting and persuasion and influence, and uh, you know that the way to get engagement and attention is to elicit an emotion, right? And the most powerful emotion that you can elicit that gets like the most sort of engagement is fear. If you trigger people's fear, you can... If, so fear, anger, they both work really well. This is why you see like... This is why people think like, oh, Twitter's full of like angry people and everyone's angry and hits because that's the kind of content that gets the most engagement. I would say after, you know, sort of fear and anger. And this is why you also see, you know, there's always like some food that's killing you and you should own, never touch, don't drink tap water and don't brush your teeth with fluoride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm yeah. not saying like, I don't know what those, if those things are true, untrue, whatever. Like I've brushed, my, I've drank tap water all my life. I've brushed my teeth. I think with fluoride toothpaste, I'm still alive. And everyone that I know does the same thing, but there's always all these things. And those things are always like prolifer pr proliferating because they're like fear-based. And then there's anger-based, you know, Trump's a misogynist and Kamala's a communist and she's going to ruin the country. And like, those are all things that elicit anger. And then you have the, probably the next most powerful emotion to elicit engagement, which luckily is positive, which is humor. And the, the internet is full of memes and funny stories and funny shit happening and funny videos, right? That's the next best thing. And then so on down from that. And like the sort of like positive feel good stuff doesn't make the news because it's like, might even yeah. make you envious, might even make the person envious. Like, oh, I don't want to click on that. I don't want to know how somebody like got lucky and like, you know, their yeah, life's exactly. going really well yeah. when mine is shit. It's better to feel like, well, luckily I didn't fall off a bridge in India. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, crazy. Exactly. So, now that you knew like, are all into Bitcoin. What what is like your favorite? I think we talked about like why why Bitcoin or kind of like what is the what is money and stocks and investing and stuff like today. You're obviously also into Bitcoin. What is kind of like your favorite mental model for explaining Bitcoin and 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 why it's so important? I'm not sure that I have one, and I yeah, that's a bad answer. You know what? To be honest, like when people talk about mental models, I I'm like it's I can't remember what the other word was. People always say like thinking from first principles, right? Mm. And I was like, and I hear you hear like Elon Musk and you know any Tim Ferriss podcast like, oh, I like to think of this from first principles. I'm like, I still don't know what that means, and I still don't quite know what a mental model is in terms of like, yeah, I mean the way I like, I think the simplest way, I think the thing that draws people into Bitcoin, at least people in the in the Western world, in the in sort of the wealthier countries, is number go up, right? Mm. And so if you can get them to understand supply and demand and the fact that Bitcoin is scarce and fiat money is not scarce, then, you know, number is going to go up against fiat currency forever unless they stop printing money or something. So that's the easiest way to explain it, I yeah. find, the, the simplest way to explain it. It still requires an understanding and a belief, you know, it's, it, it, it requires, like you said, a shattering of trust in the system. Because I have friends who I say that to, and they say, well, the government will figure it out. They'll just figure out how to make mm. another currency or whatever. You know, yeah. They immediately don't even want to engage in that. Yeah. I don't know. What's yours? I think I ended on... So the guy I talked to this morning, I explained... I, I ended up on like time and energy. So I explained it like, okay, you have a finite life, right? You don't know how long you're going to be here. So your time is finite and thus also the energy that you can output within that time. And mm -hmm. basically that is your productivity, right? Like that's what you can output in order to create things. So whether that is in a job or a venture or a product or a service doesn't, doesn't really matter. 
Because when you look around you, you, right, like everything you see costs energy to create or, or maintain li mm -hmm. literally everything. So if you trade your finite time, finite energy in time, right, your productivity for a reward that can be infinitely created without doing actual work for it, without any energy being expended to create that reward, then that is, uh, yeah, pretty dumb trade because the people, right? I think it's interesting. You said they, right? Like they, the government will figure that out. So it's energy combined with realizing that the government is just other people, right? Just other people that fall into some sort of system, try to do their job within the system, you know, not even in a, in, in a malicious way. They're just following, you know, the orders or the structure or whatever. But you have to realize that they don't care. They don't care about your individual life as much as you do. Right. So you expend this energy and time to build your own life in, you know, whatever way. But the reward, what you're using to build that, the money, right, is influenced by other people that don't care about you. So if you care about yourself, you should care about the reward that you get for expending this energy and time. And you should be rewarded or at least, you know, transform your flawed reward into something that can a, a finite thing. That can actually store that energy, you know, towards the future in time and space until you want to use that energy to buy other things that cost energy to create or maintain. So I'm kind of like talking around that, that topic a lot because I think it doesn't necessarily introduce or pitch Bitcoin from the beginning. It's more getting them into this concept. Okay. Yeah. I, I agree that I have finite time and energy. I agree that I want to save this energy towards the future, right? And it's interesting because when people say saving, when I talked to the guy this morning, I said saving is not the amount of units that you save. We, we, we touched upon that too, right? With the index. Like if I have more units in the future, did I grow my wealth or, or, you know, if it's the same amount of units in 30 years as I have now, did I save my wealth? No, because the, the, the thing that you save in represents something else because eventually you want to spend it or use it for energy right so it's kind of like money is like an abstract for energy and that should be a constant thing it should be something that is never influenced or changed or else you cannot save this energy towards the future well yeah so some something like that so around these topics of finite time and energy versus like well a, a finite reward that is an an equal reward for your input basically yeah, I like it. I, the, the, you know, the whole like Bitcoin is energy or Bitcoin is a battery or Bitcoin is time. Those mm -hmm. are, for me, they were more adv advanced concepts that I only started to look at and understand. Like once I was like, once I'd exhausted the number go up, yeah. you know, bulltard narratives of then you start. But, but those are, those are, yeah, I, I love that mental model. Those, and those apply to like other hard assets as well. Exactly, because then you right. can compare yeah. as well, right? So then he said, well, but gold. And then I said, okay, gold is is okay, but there are some properties of Bitcoin that are just superior to gold, right? Like transportation, there's no fake Bitcoin, you know, st stuff like that. Yeah. And, I, you know, I think that's also... Th but then if someone asks that question, you know they understand the first part, right? And I think, well, you, you worked in a business and startup world, right? Like people have to understand the problem before they adopt the solution. So I love number go up. You know, I think number go up is a great marketing for, for Bitcoin in a sense. And it will trigger some people to think the next question, which is why is it going up? You know, and I think that is kind of a push towards, you know, different paths in this rabbit hole. And I think one of those paths is this productivity or finite time part, because that is what you measure any country in. It's literally GDP is the output of the country, of the people in the country, right? And once you realize that the GDP is a number which does not show the value and you understand that this number is increased all the time because we always have to grow, right? That's the policy because no grow, no growth is, is bad, right? Like that's kind of the in the political realm, that's the story, right? Nobody wants to say our GDP went down or growth is is down, right? Everyone wants to say it's up, up, up. But yeah, once you really measure the productivity output and people realize, okay, yeah, that's my productivity is actually how I earn money, you know, again, in whatever way. And I need to protect the reward that I get from that. I think that's when they start understanding at least their 
maybe some hidden need, right? That's the need of every human, I think. You need to save the energy that you get rewarded with. And then they also could start seeing the problem, which is, well, the reward that you get now is just infinitely created and therefore debased. And so it's not it's not a good reward or at least not a good system to save the energy in. Yeah, you could. Uh, so you're, just whilst you were talking there, you got me thinking on, on, on the topic of energy, right? You could almost say that money exists as a solution to a problem of inefficiency, right? The mm -hmm. way we trade is inefficient and the fact that for us to produce things that we need to live, like not just what, not just like, not our, our wants, but our needs, right? They take a certain amount of energy and time to make. And so money became a way that if you're making, if you're creating excess value, you have a way to store that value. And you have a way to then go and buy, you know, you don't have the, the double coincidence of once, which is like with barter where, you know, you have to have the thing that the person who you want something from needs in order to be able to get what you want. Yeah. Like if you yeah. go to the like sheep farmer to get some wool, but you only have eggs and he wants horseshoes too bad. You don't get any wool. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So money solves that problem. But you know, on, on the topic of, of, AI, and I don't think that many people are talking about this yet. Like Bitcoin is the best money, I think, and we all think that. Um, but what happens when we don't actually need money anymore? Because what happens when technology and AI brings the cost of, or let's think about it this way, the, in, the input of energy required to generate things is so low that it's virtually drives everything down to almost be free, right? And you have you know, for a little bit of you, everyone gets some robot and an AI that knows everything and can do everything for them. You don't need to trade anymore. I agree. I, I think actually the, how do you say, like the, the moment in time where all these things come together is very fascinating, right? So I agree. Let's say the AIs do all the work, right? And we, we, we don't have to work anymore. Let's take the extreme case, right? This is actually already going on, right? Like this is a supercomputer. I am already yeah. a, a, a cyborg, right? But well, the calculator in it is free, but the thing is not free, right? And I think the biggest powers that are fighting with each other is the, you know, this is Jeff Booth talk, right? Deflationary mm. effect of improved technology. Well, AI is the epitome of technology, you know, in, in our day and age, I'd say, which is battling the inflationary characteristics of the debt-based money system. So how can something that is so profoundly deflationary like AI, right? If, if you really dive into AI and, and what people say about, you know, how it can take over lots of different jobs, even to being a hair cutter, right? Or, yep. or, or building houses like robots with AI building homes, like it, it's everywhere. Yeah, these, these forces are going to clash. Because as you said, like if you really look into the future of AI, it could take over everything, let's say in a positive way, right? And really help us progress. Maybe, you know, some people even say maybe enlighten us because we have more time to, you know, think about, you know, what is going on here in the in this infinite, you know, space space that we live in. But the system that it's replacing is the dependent on things being inflationary and 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 staying or, or keep being debased basically and so i think i don't know what the outcome is but i think that is a very big battle it's bigger than what we had before i think because this debt based based system is also gearing like it's 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 moving towards the end right like we had the internet revolution but at that time you know, there was, of course, already like a big debt in the United States and all these things, but it was, it was just less worrisome. So I think this AI combined with, you know, the, the debt spiral in America is just a really interesting phenomenon because they cannot flip the switch and say like, well, okay, you know, we blow up and the AI takes over. Like, I don't know. I, I have no clue what that's going to be, but I, I see like these two forces are, are working, working against each other. Yeah. I think, I think. That the, the obviously the, the efficiencies driven by technology are also part of the reason why a lot of the population feels like, you know, I can't keep up with my bills. I can't, you know, I can't make enough money to buy a house. I can't make enough money to start a family and whatever, because for a certain slice of the socioeconomic 
slice of the population, right? They have their skills are things that now AI can do or that robots can do or that some sort of machine or automation can do, right? And so they haven't found, they haven't changed their skills or upgraded the skills to move, to be, to go somewhere and do something where those skills are in demand and, and are still valuable because we haven't got AI doing that. Or we haven't got technology that can do that, right? Like, look, 10 years ago, it was like being an Uber driver was a great, like, you know, blue collar job. You could make way more money than mm-hmm. working at McDonald's or whatever. What, and now we have Waymo, which is cars that drive themselves around San Francisco. You don't even need a human anymore. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I it's, agree. But it's, but it's also, yeah, I think it's also because people, I talked about this before, but people are also trapped, right? Like, because they have to keep up with this inflation, they, you know, because their money is debasing, they need more units. So they need to do all these different side hustles, et cetera. People also don't have time and space to figure out what is it that I actually enjoy to do, right? Like, what am I actually good at? Like, they are, they are, they are trapped in this hamster wheel of keeping up again, you know, not even consciously, right? But there's no, I think even the thought of you sharing that is not something that the majority of people think about. They are just yes. moving, moving on, basically. It's true. I think, look, one of the biggest things I ever, one of the most important things I ever did in my life, I was just thinking about like what happens when AI takes over everything and we're all just sitting around and we can become self-actualized because we can, we have the time to think and study and like just, you know, get, become better educated and informed such that we can pull on levers that, you know, make greater things happen. Like for me, it was, I remember working like a 10 hour a day job where I had to be in an office from a certain time to a certain time. And whilst I was there, I was surrounded by colleagues and I couldn't really like, you know, listen to a podcast or like read a book that I was interested in or whatever. I was sitting there either doing work or I was sitting there pretending I was doing work, but I didn't really have any work to do. But either way, I had to like, the time couldn't be used for something else. And then I decided to, at, at some point in my life, I was like, I need to optimize my life for maximum freedom. Obviously, you still need to work. You still need to make money to pay rent and be responsible, whatever. But there are ways to work that are lower leverage and there are ways to work that are higher leverage. And for me, the first little like leverage thing that I did was divorce my time from my income. And that I literally went from a job that paid a salary where I had to be somewhere at nine to six or whatever it is, right? To, to working a sales job where I made zero dollars. It was all commission based, right? But I didn't have to be anywhere at any time, right? And yeah. so it was, I could, I could schedule my work and do it to the point that I needed to do it to make the money I needed to make. And then the rest of the time I could spend upskilling or reading books I enjoyed or, you know, doing exercise to make sure I was healthy or figuring out how I can make more money doing my job. But, but it was freeing that time up. And yeah, a lot of people are trapped in like, gigs where they don't have that free time. You know, you get, you work from nine to six doing some soul crushing job that you hate that isn't stimulating for you at all. And then you have to do a 45 minute commute each way on the subway, you know, crammed with other people and you get home, you're exhausted. You don't have, I like when I did that, I didn't have the energy to go. I wasn't like get home at 7 PM and like, yeah, I'm going to cook a healthy meal and start a side hustle so I can get rich. And like, then I'm going to go to the gym. No, I was like, I'll sit on the couch, I'll watch like Entourage and eat a bag of Cheetos and then feel like shit the next day and go on with my life. So the best thing I did was divorce my time from my money. Cause yeah, that bought me, that bought me time and energy to invest into making my life better, figuring out like even just having time to figure out what I wanted from life, what is possible, what are other people doing? How did they do it? How can I do what they did? Right? So this is like completely off topic to Bitcoin, but it is sort of not because it is about buying back your time so that you can invest it better in things that are going to make your life better. Yeah. And in, definitely in whatever being able way, to save. Right? Yeah. yeah. Being able to save in a currency or in an asset that's not being debased like dollars are, right? Without needing to constantly keep up if you're like doing stock market investing or whatever, that is very time and energy saving and you can invest that time and energy into other stuff. Yeah. Yeah, correct. Entourage, the best show ever, by the way. So good. But what, what, so what made you make that shift in your mind then? 
Was there something someone said or something happened? Like what, what was that for you then? It was just like literal pure. I can't remember why. So, okay. Now I'll go back. So I was working in a, I was working like a logistics. I, I graduated in 2011 from university. 2010, 2011. Anyway, it was like right, you know, still in the aftermath of the financial crisis. And I wanted to become an investment manager or work in finance or whatever. And of course, I didn't get any jobs in finance because there were none. Like I got to the last eight that for the Fidelity Investments graduate scheme. And I asked them, I was like, how many people applied for this job? They're like a thousand. So I got to the last eight. And I remember going to the assessment day, which is like when the last eight candidates go into the Fidelity offices and we had to, they gave us a stock to, and we had to pick whether we would buy or sell and why we would do that, right? And I remember walking into the offices the day of this assessment and the other candidates were there. And the first thing they asked me was like, so where did you intern this summer? As if it was a given that I had interned at some bank, right? And they had like, one's parents like owned a hedge fund. So they interned there. The other people, one guy had like completed his G capital degree. Anyway, I'm long story short. I wanted to get into finance, couldn't get into finance. So I just like after six months of six months of searching for a job, I got a job in logistics and it was like shift work. So I worked like six days on, two days off, morning, afternoon, and night shifts. And during my like teenage years when I became obsessed with like investing in Warren Buffett, one of the things was like I read Rich Dad Poor Dad and he's big into real like Robert Kiyosaki, right? So he's big into real estate. So I was like, oh, real estate's how you get rich. That's you know, that's what I want to do. And it just so happened that one time when I was, I quit one of my logistics jobs and I was about to take another one for like, I was going to get paid like 3000 US a month or something. Yeah. I'm like 24 or something the other time. And it just so happened that somebody that a family friend was starting an online brokerage in Hong Kong. And he was like, why doesn't your son come and work with us? And so I met up with him and he told me the deals, be a real estate agent. And yeah, you can be commission only, but you know, if you close this many deals, this is how much money you could get. And I was like, whoa, that's a lot more than I could make at the logistics job, although it's not guaranteed, right? But I just thought I can do it. And so I was like, fuck the logistics thing, went to the real estate thing. And I think it was the potential to earn that pulled me over there. But it was there I realized that having the freedom that I, I really enjoyed having the freedom because all my friends had normal like white collar office jobs. They had to be somewhere from it's not this is way before like any remote work was a thing or whatever. It was like pretty revolutionary. Like, wow, you don't have to go to an office and you don't have to be there. And like, yeah, but I also make zero dollars <laughs> if I don't, you know, yeah. I can't just go to, I, I don't get paid if I do nothing. Right. Is, is this what sovereignty is to you? Yeah. I mean, sovereignty to me is like being able to do whatever you want, whenever you want and not having to rely on anyone or at least to have maximum being able, you know, having so many options that you don't have to rely on any single option, let's say, right? Because you always rely on, you know, if you have a business, you rely on your clients you're on doing a good job and having clients. Or, you know, if you have a job, you rely on your employer to keep you there. And so you're always relying on something, but it's like, you don't want to rely on one thing. Like if your employer mm -hmm. fires you, there's no other options. Or if your one client leaves you, you go bankrupt. Yeah. So Sovereignty to me is having options and being able the options is what, what like gets you the closest to being able to do whatever you want. Yeah. Before we move to what you're doing now, I saw a, a tweet of yours that said the real vote is owning Bitcoin. And I wanted to ask you to explain your thought behind that. Yeah. I mean, I just, uh, I think, yeah, I, th I think that if we can get more people earning Bitcoin, it kind of, it, it is the state requires a trust in fiat currency and control of the money to function, right? So if we can get as many people off using fiat or at least off trusting fiat and into Bitcoin, you automatically defund the government, right? And I think that's the only way you're going to create the systemic change that's necessary for at least the collapse that we're heading towards now not to happen, right? Because if governments keep having control of the money. It doesn't matter if you vote for Trump or you vote for Kamala, we're heading in the same direction. It just might be like one will take route A and one will take route B, but we're, we're headed there no matter what. So I don't, I'm not like, I, I don't understand the whole, like Kamala's evil and Trump is good. And, you know, Trump is evil and Kamala's good. And one of them is with one of them, you know, the country will be ruined. And with the other, the country will be saved. No, it's like, it's the problem is the system. We need a new system, right? We don't need to, vote for another politician 
thinking they're going to change things. We need a new system. To me, Bitcoin is the new system. Yeah. So you you currently live in Dubai and you, you lived in Hong Kong, as you mentioned. How do you think Bitcoin could impact the way people live and migrate? I mean, you know, there's there's these elections. There's one like pro candidate. There's there's one anti Bitcoin candidate. You know, you, there's a lot of stuff happening in Europe. I think, well, if people vote with their money and they are into Bitcoin, they are also yeah free to move a bit more. So yeah, I'm personally really interested in like the policy part of global game theory. If I can move my capital anywhere, then you know I can move myself anywhere. What what's your view on that? Having lived and 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 moved in in these countries. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the like you can you can move without Bitcoin, and you know you have US. You have a, for, for most people in most Western countries, you can move around and take your capital with you. It's not super difficult. Uh, like I've mostly kept bank accounts open, like everywhere I've gone. You know, they, I have like bank accounts that I'll keep forever, even if I don't live in those countries, just to have the optionality. But it is true that obviously Bitcoin lets you do it in a much more sovereign way because you're, again, not relying on a bank or some institution to let you have access to your money here or charge you for transferring from here to there, or you have to sell everything in one place and buy it back again in a different bank. Uh, so in that sense, it's just a better, it's just a better way of doing it from like a purely logistical perspective. Never mind the, the monetary side of it, that it's like a better asset. It's just mm. easier to take your private keys, pick them up, you know, leave the country, go to wherever you want to live. You still have your private keys. You don't need to reset anything up. Yeah. All right. So what are you currently working on? I read that, uh, you know, you were an entrepreneur before, then you worked at, at a Bitcoin company called Brains. Now you're back on the entre entrepreneurial path. Is this also something that is related to to Bitcoin or yeah, what, what are you yeah. currently exploring? Yeah. To me, it's all tied to me. It's all tied for freedom. Like I always try to make decisions based on what's going to give me the maximum amount of freedom. So for example, my job at Brains was like, as far as jobs go, it was very similar to what I did in real estate. As long as I got my work done, it didn't really matter if I worked from nine to seven, or if I wanted to take the morning to do something else and work. That. It, it was freedom it, there was a lot of freedom in terms of in terms of time there wasn't loads of freedom in terms of earning potential because obviously you know jobs there's only so much money they can pay you before it just doesn't make sense to to pay you that anymore and that's where i think entrepreneurship is amazing because you can capture a hundred percent of the value you create and you have infinite leverage and ability to scale obviously dependent on the business model so and and you have you know having a business if you have enough clients you're also not relying on any one client to keep you going, right? Whereas like when you have a job, you get fired. Okay, you can find another job. It still sucks. If you have an, a company with 30 clients and one of your clients leaves, as long as they're not a huge portion of your revenue, you trudge along and you can replace them. So all these things are tied to freedom and sovereignty. Uh, and I've really enjoyed being an entrepreneur. I enjoyed being able to create as much value as I could and capture as much of that value as I could Obviously, being able to make more money that gives you more freedom. For me, the biggest thing going from real estate to what I do now was that you, my 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 real estate career was based in Hong Kong, so I was a little bit geographically dependent. If something happened in Hong Kong or I didn't want to live in Hong Kong anymore, it required a big upheaval. So when when I owned my last real estate business, I was already in the process of thinking like, what am I going to? How can I whilst I have this business? How can I change my skill set and figure out a way so that I can work so that my skills are valuable regardless of where I live? And that just so happened to be like, yeah. I got on Twitter, I started learning copywriting, writing, marketing, and those are skills that, although it's, it's nice to have the Bitcoin domain knowledge, I can take those skills and apply them to anything. And yeah, after almost three years at, at brains for me it was just it was time to get back to doing my own thing again just for maximum freedom maximum sovereignty and maximum upside uh, so i you know i knew that the the one thing that was had been a constant along with bitcoin in the last three years was like twitter my writing on twitter i really enjoyed it it was going well people are following me so that's a signal to me that there was some demand for what i was doing mm. uh, and then in just the, in exploring sort of potential businesses i started a sort of like personal brand strategy slash ghostwriting agency. Mm -hmm. So I, I just basically want to help people 
put themselves out there so that they, they can get whatever they want from their business. It's, it's mostly it's mostly for entrepreneurs, right? They're using it's people who want to build a personal brand so that they can leverage for some sort of business purpose. Uh, yeah. And yeah, I just think we all have a we all have a brand. Our brand is just like our reputation, right? You have a reputation regardless of whether you care about it or not. So I really think in the day and age where you can scale yourself on the internet, it's silly. It's silly not to. And it's one of the most, along with earning some Bitcoin, I think like being an entrepreneur or at the very least thinking of yourself as a business, even if you're not going to start a business, but like thinking of yourself as a business and you want to get a better job, get a higher paying job, like personal branding all plays into, into that. I don't think I've interviewed for a job in God knows how long because it's just been, you know, people already know me from Twitter. They don't need to figure me out. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so the opportunities are just more about, they're not about me applying and being assessed. It's more about they come to me and I decide whether I want to do it or not. Love that. So you are working on a Bitcoin related book, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I'm working on, well, I have two books that I want to write. Mm -hmm. Well, I have lots of books, but two books that I, that are going to be the next two books I write. And both of them are, one is a biography of somebody who's well known in the Bitcoin space and outside the Bitcoin space before he got into Bitcoin. And the other one is the, is the same. So I don't know if you heard of Wences Casares. No. So he was like Michael Saylor before Michael Saylor. Oh, really? Yeah. I have a um, thread. I'll, I'll DM it to you after. He He's known as Bitcoin's patient zero. So in 2013, he orange pilled. A lot of the people that are, that you know, you'd know from traditional finance or Silicon Valley as Bitcoiners, he got them into Bitcoin. He was the guy that like figured out Bitcoin and explained it to all these guys. So like Mike Novogratz credits him with getting Chamath from the All In podcast credits him with getting him into Bitcoin. Dan, what's the guy's name? From Pantera, Dan Moorhead. I don't Mm -hmm. know if you've heard of him. These are all guys now that like traditional Tim Draper. So these are like all TradFi, Wall Street guys. He got Reid Hoffman into Bitcoin. He got Bill Gates into Bitcoin once upon a time before Bill Gates then got off Bitcoin. Yeah. So it's uh, one book is going to be basically taking how he explains Bitcoin because he was so successful at orange pilling all these people. I want to cut and there's no like single source of, of the way he explains Bitcoin. So I'm kind of like using all the resources there are out there about him talking about Bitcoin and compiling those into a book that are like the way he explains Bitcoin. Uh, sort mm. of like the the almanac of Naval yeah, from yeah, Wences nice. Casares and Bitcoin, and then he's got a crazy life story. He was a he grew up son of sheep farmers in the middle of Patagonia and Argentina, became a very early internet entrepreneur, sold a company for five hundred million dollars, and then discovered Bitcoin at three dollars and bought a shit ton of Bitcoin. It's rumored that he has like one million Bitcoin personally. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. well, I'm I'm looking forward to that to that book, man. That's very cool. So yeah. To, to wrap up, what, what is your vision for the future of Bitcoin? How do you look at, let's say, the next 10, 20 years? I mean, I would love it if it, it, I think it just makes sense to have one universal currency that we use everywhere in the world, right? So like, I can look at a loaf of bread and I don't have to convert from one currency to another to, to figure out how much it costs. It would be lovely to just go around you know, you can be, you can go to Thailand and think, oh, things are so cheap, but you still need to convert it from Thai baht into some currency that you have a reference point for to know if something is cheap or not. So I think from that perspective, like it would just be amazing to have a one, one currency that's used all around the world. It'd be awesome for everyone to use money that can't be corrupted by any single entity. I think that's like just, that's just ethical and fair yeah. at a fundamental level. I think what governments do with money. And especially it hits, you know, obviously it hits the poorest people who don't own any assets. It hits them the hardest. So that, yeah, use everyone using your money that's not controlled by anyone. And I think if we all used Bitcoin, if it became the, I don't even want to say global reserve currency, but the one currency that most people used, so many more people would have access to, you know, financial tools, like being able to send money across the world to each other. Like those people that can't get banking, who can't send money to like family in another country or, you know, even to their like sister who's moved across to a different city without doing something very time consuming and energy consuming. So there's so many advantages to it beyond the like debasement of fiat and all those things that it it is just better. So that would be, I mean, I think that takes longer than, longer than 10 to 20 years. 
but it'll be interesting because like, you know, gradually then suddenly with, I think that the death of fiat currency ha will happen. Well, let's just say the death of the dollar, the dollar when it does die will happen very, very quickly. And it'll just be interesting to see whether Bitcoin replaces it or whether it gets replaced by another fiat created by the US government, which is what's happened in the majority of times in the past is when someone's fiat currency dies, they just make another one and say, this one's now worth this much. And everyone goes, yeah. okay, but we never had Bitcoin before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You made me think of something that I wanted to add what I said before, you know, about the finite energy and time and connect that to what you said. Like if there's a universal, I actually just send you on Twitter DM. I'm, I'm finishing up an article where that's titled Bitcoin is the standard measurement for human productivity. So it should be the, the, the ruler, right? Like the meter is a ruler, like the standard meter is a ruler for a certain type of distance. To add to what I said before about energy and time, what I find so interesting is that this energy and time, let's say there's three people, right? One in Italy, one in the Congo, and one in Mexico, right? And they all do the exact same thing in the exact amount of time, right? So they built, yeah, I always have the example of a shed. They built a shed in someone's backyard for a thousand units of their local currency or whatever or they agreed to. But they expend the same amount of energy in the same amount of time. But because all their rewards are different, right? Pesos, euros, and I don't know what they use in the Congo. That already is a problem. The fact that this human productivity is measured in these three totally different ways. Eventually, it's the same system, right? Like fiat money system, but just the value of each unit mm. of each of these different currencies values this human productivity in a different way. So we are lucky that we are in a more Western country where the currency is stronger than someone else's. So we can go to Thailand and buy more with the amount that, that we have. But that doesn't mean different amounts of energy go into a Thai mango than an American mango, right? Or any, any dish that's cooked or any building that's built. And I think, yeah, just thinking of that to add to, to, to what you're saying, like if, if you have a standard measurement for, for value for human productivity, then it doesn't matter if you have to exchange it into a local currency because that's what they still use. But I think Bitcoin can act as this global measurement for human productivity. And yeah, that's just that. I just want to add that. No, it's funny. It's funny you say that. So when Cess mentions this in podcasts in like 2013, 2014, and he calls Bitcoin a global standard of value. And he's yeah, like, exactly. you know, you have meters and you have miles and you have kilometers and you have centimeters. You know, why don't we have the same thing for, for value measurements? So yeah. it makes it. Yeah. Yeah. I think this could be a talking point that combined with, you know, this time, energy, your productivity, etc., could be interesting also to to explain also better why Bitcoin exists, right? And how it could help people uh, basically all, all around the world, right? Yeah, interesting. Uh, well, I sent you the article. It would be awesome if, if, you, if you could read it. Let me know what you think uh, before I publish it. I wanted to ask you the last question that I, that I ask everyone, which is the same question always, which is what is a core belief that you will never let go? Man, that's a deep one. What's a core belief that I have that I'll never let go? I don't know. I like to think that, I mean, a belief. I mean, I think there are realities that will always be realities, but I don't know about a belief that I'll never let go. I don't think I have a belief that I'll never let go of. I think that there's things I believe today that could be wrong or they're based on some bias that I will get that I won't have in the future anymore. Mm. I can't necessarily think of... Can you give me an example of something that someone else has said? See if that spurs in. Like, love will always win or... Yeah, mm. there's, a, there's a good one that you ask it back. Like, my goal of this is I want to make 100 episodes and then afterwards make a compilation. That's kind I mean, of... so like, there are truths, right? But I, I wouldn't frame those as beliefs. I think, well, the, 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 the truth in that sense is probably also always sub also subjective, right? Yeah, true. Okay, I've got... A core belief that I don't think I'll ever let go of is that I think if you want to be, I think if you want to be, if you want maximum freedom in your life, you have to become, you have to find a way to start or own a piece of a business and you have to save the excess fruits of your labor in Bitcoin. And that's how you get maximal, maximal freedom, maximum optionality. I don't Boom. think I will ever, I don't think I'll ever change that belief. Love that. That's a great ender, yeah. man. 
Well, thanks so much for this conversation. I really enjoyed it. And yeah, we'll stay in touch. I'm excited to, to pre-read your book when it's ready. Thanks for having me, Bram. It's awesome. Awesome. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, also make sure to check out this video right here or go to my page and check out all the episodes of Bitcoin for Millennials. I appreciate your support and hope to see you for another episode. Bye. Bye.